remember when I was a teenager, I particularly remember one time they called me into the principal's office. My parents were there. And the principal said, Mr. and Mrs. Davis, uh, we've met with the Board of Education. <laughs> and we've met with the entire faculty. And we've decided to put uh, your son to sleep. So uh, that's what they said. Welcome. My prayer is <laughs> that that isn't what I do to you today put you to sleep. Jesus said to his disciples in the book of John, chapter 13, my children, I can only be with you a little bit longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, he said. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he said this. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I grew up under a system of thought that I believe strangled my Christian life for many years. And the system of thought was simply this, that Christianity was defined by a list of things you did or didn't do. And that if you could avoid the list of nine nasties, then that made you a good Christian. In my little circle, that meant if you didn't smoke, if you didn't drink, if you didn't chew, if you didn't dance, if you didn't go to the theater, if you didn't play cards, and the list went on. There were several things on the list that I see are astonishing these young people here. <laughs> if you didn't do those things, then you were a good Christian. And at 16 years old, I sat on my own porch steps and watched my dog, Ralph, walk by. Ralph was a collie dog that we had owned. I loved Ralph. And suddenly it hit me. Ralph didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't chew. He didn't dance. Ralph had never been in a theater. He didn't play cards. And we never let him run around with dogs who did those things. <laughs> and there are dogs who do those things. I've seen the paintings. I visited Saudi Arabia many years ago, a country that has strict rules that would probably have half of us in jail. They don't do a lot of things, but they don't know Jesus. Jesus said, love is what makes the difference. I don't know if there's anything that taught me more about love than having child. I didn't want children. I didn't want to have children. It isn't that we hated them, it's just that we met one. <laughs> we went to a house to eat. They sat me next to a one and a half year old child to eat. That's got to be one of the grossest experiences in all of life. Do any of you have little brothers or sisters? This kid picked up a pea and spoke to it in a language I did not understand. All of the phonetics was there, but no words. You know what I'm talking about? They have no words, but it sounds right.
Diane, my wife, understood this language. They used to come to her and go, Labby, nor de busekembe. And she would say, you better not. <laughs> then this child smashed the pea. And you could see by the disgusted look on his face that he didn't know what to do with this. It was, it was gross. It was all of those words you guys use. It was icky. And so he hid it in this ear. I'm trying to eat a steak. The kid has 15 peas draining out of his right ear. He got jello, clear up to his armpits. Then he got friendly with me. I whispered to him, you touch me, I'll drop kick you. <laughs> On the way home, I looked over at my wife, Diane. She was quietly rubbing food stains from her dress. I said, sweetheart, I don't ever want to have children. I don't want to have children. Through clenched teeth, she said, neither do I. A couple of months later, we went to the doctor. <laughs> no, you're way ahead of me here. <laughs> you need to back off a little bit. We went to the doctor, and the doctor told us, after an examination, he said, the we were incapable of having children. I remember sitting in the office across from him, he said, it is physically impossible for you to have children. And God sat right up on his throne. He loves the word impossible. I have two children. We named the first one physically. <laughs> the second one married Scott Fowler. She's impossible. And I wouldn't trade those two children for anything on the face of the earth. They have taught me more about love than anything else that I have ever done. I was there the day they were born. What a miracle. Beyond anything I'd ever experienced before. I had cameras set up in the room. 35 millimeter slide camera on a, on a tripod. I had an old 16 millimeter movie camera. I was going to take pictures. I have no pictures. There were three people in the room, then there were four people in the room. I freaked out. I ran out of there to call my wife and tell her. She wasn't home. The doctor brought that child over to me. He said, would you like to hold her? I need to tell you, I fell instantly in love. This is a guy who treated his wife like dirt because she was pregnant. I was working in the ministry making $8,000 a year. She was working at a bank making $22,000 a year. I liked it that way. I didn't want it to change. I didn't want kids with stuff all over their hands reaching for me and destroying my clothes. I had such a bad attitude, I got kicked out of Lamaze. I'm one of the only men in the world to be kicked out of Lamaze class. They showed a movie one night, and I said, could you run it backwards? They don't have a sense of humor in there. Some of you have seen the movie. But when that child was born, the second she was born, and every mom and dad, and I ask these young people to be up here because I want them to understand this message. I want you to look in my eyes and see that I'm not here just trying to make you laugh or make you feel good by being on stage. I want you to understand this message from the perspective of a parent who loves his kids so much that sometimes it hurts. I'd have died for her if she was born. I'm telling you the truth. If the doctor had come to me and said the only way this child can live is if you give your life for her, I would have died for her. And I came to a whole new understanding of love. A whole new understanding, maybe a little bit, just a little hint of what God feels for us. When he sat with his disciples, he addressed them not, Gentlemen, let's call this meeting to order. He said, Little children, listen to me. Little children, I can't be with you much longer. Oh, how he loved them. 
How he loves you. How he loves you. I sat in the corner weeping. I didn't know what else to do. I was sitting right on the floor. The doctor came over with the little child. He said, would you like to hold her? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, she'll break. He said, stand up. Because I was sitting on the floor. I stood up and before I could protest, he put that baby in my arms. Her little hand shot out. She grabbed a hold of my little finger and wrapped her entire soul around my heart in the same moment. I made a terrible mistake. I blinked. And when I opened my eyes again, I was still weeping. And she was still in my arms but I was leaving her in a college dorm room 400 miles from our home. And do you know what it's like for a father who loves his child? Some of you young ladies, do you know what it's like to do what I did last December? To stand in the back of the church and have that little tiny baby girl all dressed in white. Now her hands aren't squeezing my finger, they're squeezing my arm. You look up to the front of the per church and the little pervert's up there waiting for her. <laughs> Every dad in here knows what I'm talking about. I don't want Bill to get a lot of letters. I don't want to get any letters. So I'll tell you this, I love Scott Fowler with all of my heart. But I'll say it again. <laughs> she squeezed my arm, she said, I love you, Daddy. Found out later she didn't say it because she loves me. She does love me. She has confirmed her love over and over again. But she didn't say it because she loved me. She said it because she and her sister had a bet that they could make me cry during the wedding. <laughs> I didn't cry. I did not cry. I bit my lip real hard. I just bit it like this. Look at me. <laughs> I bit it just like this. Made my way to the front of the church, but I did get messed up real bad. The preacher said, who giveth? this woman to this man. <laughs> and I said, my mother and I. <laughs> Me and mom. <laughs> I remember when my children used to hide and obscure corners of the house. They would leap out suddenly when I went by. They would wait sometimes for hours. Like some alien creature, they would wrap their arms around me and say, Boo! I love you! And my heart would stop and I would hug them and I would say, Oh, I love you too. How oh, I love to hear those words. I love you too. If you do that again, I'm going to kill you, but I, I love you. <laughs> I love you. I can't tell you the joy they brought into our house. We used to argue with our kids about stuff that doesn't matter. I've got two of the most beautiful daughters on the face of the earth, and they lived like pigs. <laughs> Their rooms were trash heaps. I went down there one time, roaches and mice were coming out with their suitcases going, we can't live like this anymore. You know what happens now? I'm just a dad. So now I go down there and mess the bed up a little bit, wishing it could be dirty like it was before. There's a reason that God chose in the Bible 
to call us children. There's a reason he used the family as an example of his relationship to us. His love for us surpasses what the love of the best father in the world is for his son or for his daughter. I think sometimes we complicate the gospel. I think sometimes we get all twisted in what Christianity is all about. And we forget the words of the Master who said, you want people to know that you follow me? Love each other. With the intensity and quality that I loved you. I am convinced with every fiber of my being that the greatest need of America, the greatest need in the world, and it matters not whether you sit in a corporate tower or whether you sing songs on this stage or you go to high school, it doesn't matter how much money you make, every human heart has within it a gaping wound, a hole, a wound that was initiated when sin entered the world when we found ourselves separated from the Father who loves us so much. And you can take every social ill you can imagine, and almost all of it, if you get right down to the lowest common denominator, almost all of it starts from a desperate desire to heal that wound. There is nothing that the human soul needs more than to know that they are loved. That's why a parent finds such delight in the unabashed, unashamed love of a child. We were in Brownsville, Texas one time at a, at a huge conference. Whoa. This says I have four minutes left. Is that right? Okay. Scared me to death. We were in, in Brownsville, Texas at a huge conference. My youngest daughter, Taryn, who married Scott Fowler, I thought she was with, with her mother. Her mother thought she was with me. You know where she was? She was swimming in the sewage lagoon for the entire conference. It had a fence. She climbed it. She told us later that the colors were prettier. There's beautiful beach. She likes green. So she's in there draping algae all over her little body, tucking it in her little bathing suit. And then she came looking for her dad. I was sitting down by the beach in Brownsville, Texas, talking to a man about being in an industrial film. And at that time in my life, my one desire was to be a movie star. I wanted that more than anything else. And if I had to start with an industrial film, I'd start with an industrial film. She peeked up over the edge of a sand dune and saw me sitting down there. She came running. I didn't hear her coming. I didn't see her coming. She hit me doing 30, maybe 40 miles an hour. And when she hit me, all of the nasty stuff that was wrapped around her body unwrapped and wrapped itself around me. She grabbed me by the hair and yanked my head around. Violently, she did. And she kissed me nine or ten of the stinkiest kisses you've ever had in your life. And she said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I kill you with love. She said, I am the love monster. <laughs> and the man sitting next to me stood up and brushed some of the nasty stuff from himself. And he said, excuse me, could you ask her to leave until our business is finished? And I wasn't a good dad. I wasn't a good husband. But I was so overwhelmed with the love of a little girl, I turned to him and said, our business is finished now. I have no desire to be in business <laughs> with someone who does not understand or is not even slightly moved by the powerful proclamation, I love you, I love you, I love you, I am the love monster. I don't know how many of you kids claim the name of Christ, 
But I want to tell you the greatest testimony you can have to the world, the greatest personal growth you can have for yourself is to demonstrate the love of Christ in your home. I don't care how tough you think your parents are. I don't care how mean you think they are. Deep within inside them is the same gaping need to know that they are loved. And I pray that you never stop telling them. I hope you'll be obnoxious about it when you're, when you're huge and you're burly and you've got a six-day beard growing. You wrap your arms around your mom and say, I love you, and your dad. My daughter stopped saying, love, I love you, my oldest daughter, when she was 14. I used to try to coerce her. You've seen how we do it, you know. I love you. <laughs> she would say, me too. I said, say it. She said, I just did. <laughs> 14, 15, 16. I love you. <laughs> Whatever. 17, 18. When I left her at college, I held her in my arms. And tears streaming down my face, I held her at arm's length and I said, I love you. And at 18 years old, she said, Me too. I'm not a softie. I'm a creation of God. And you see within my heart is this huge wound. This wound that can only be healed when I know that I'm loved. And to hear the words I love you from a little child, from an 18-year-old child, from my wife. To hear Bill Gaither say, I love you. To hear... Some of the other people who are on this staff, Buddy Green said me, to me today, I love you, Ken Davis. We get a little hint of what heaven must be like, just a little idea of what the love of God can do. I wept all the way home. A couple of months later, they asked me to come and speak at my daughter's school. I love being up here. I love every moment of it. God has created me with a strange, this strange mind. I'm not afraid. People say, you're a liar. I'm not a liar. I'm not afraid. I want to be here. I want to be here now. I want to be here all the time. I don't want anybody else to be up here. I want to be here. <laughs> but I was petrified when I went to her school. Absolutely petrified. I stood in front of that audience and delivered my message. The chaplain asked me to go out for lunch. My daughter had to go to a class. He brought me to an Italian restaurant. He reached into his briefcase and he pulled out a stack of cards about that high. He said, in all of my tenure at this school, I have never seen such a positive response from our students. And he read several of those cards to me. And I was so gratified. They liked me. Then he pulled one out of his pocket. And he said, here's one I think that will interest you. I was eating spaghetti. I looked on the front, and on the front of the card was my daughter's name, Tracy Lynn Davis. Do you know I've jumped out of an airplane at 8,000 feet? I flew to Alaska and crashed twice. I love stuff like that. <laughs> but I didn't have the courage to turn that card over. It's only one thing worse than knowing that that wound isn't healed. And that's to think that it might be torn a little wider. Finally, I turned it over and written on the other side in big round letters, the eyes dotted with hearts were these words, I love my daddy. I spit spaghetti all over the table. <laughs> I ran for a little bathroom that they had there. I closed the door and locked the door. And I was like a child. I said, oh God, she loves me. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't know there was a guy in there. <laughs> now, I'm a comedian, but I didn't say that to be funny. There was a guy in there, and he scared me to death. <laughs> I'm going, oh, she loves me. Thank you, Jesus. And this voice goes, get a life, man. <laughs>
We are desperate for love. You think of the person that you detest the most. And you stand on common ground with that person in this area. That person is desperate for love. Desperate. We try to get that from each other. We try to heal that wound with our relationships with each other. Sometimes we try to heal that wound with things, homes and cars and success as a gospel singer. Sometimes we make mental lists of our own accomplishments, things we've done in church. Perhaps that will help heal this need, this wound. But in the late hours of the night, when that ledger can be repeated until early hours of the morning, it never adds up. I spoke at Promise Keepers in Chicago, 1985, 1995. Eighty some thousand men. The temperature on the in the center of that arena was something like 120, 130 degrees. Ambulances were pulling up and taking men away on a consistent basis. The fire department had fire hoses aimed up spraying water over thousands and thousands of men at a time so that they wouldn't suffer from heat stroke. A great setting for communication. <laughs> and I delivered this message and at the end of the message, I invited the men in that group, many of them fathers and sons. I said, would you do me a favor? I said, would you follow the words of Christ, not with the community today, not with the outside world, not with your enemy. That's hard stuff. Let's just do it with each other. Would you please stand, I said, and would you take your son in your arms and say the words, I love you. Would you say those words? I wish you could see the raw footage of the video that was taken that day and see what I saw that day. Men who may or may not have been deacons in their church, men who may or may not have been successful corporate executives in their corporation, trying to find a way to do a simple thing, to put their arms around someone with their own flesh and blood and say, I love you. And standing next to them was a 17, 18-year-old boy who wouldn't hesitate to face three linebackers ready to destroy his body, but who stood stiffly, not willing or able to express what God created us to express. And I said, men, there's no way we can call ourselves children of God and not be able to say to the people who are in our own family, I love you, I love you. I said, say it. And the Spirit of God swept across that stadium. I wish you could hear the sound of 80,000 people proclaiming those great words, I love you. And as the camera swept back across the audience one more time, it caught one more time that dad who was trying to find out how to put his arms around his son and that son who stood there stiffly only this time, they were stumbling, trying to maintain their balance as they knocked over chairs, tears streaming from their eyes. Because they had been touched just a little with the heart of God. Because the wound hadn't been healed, it can't be healed except for the forgiveness and love of Jesus Christ the, the wound hadn't necessarily been healed, but they had seen hope that it could be healed. I love you. I went to speak in the church Pentecostals of Alexandria. I believe their choir has been here sometimes. Magnificent choir. In fact, you were there, Bill. You were at this meeting. And during the meeting, the pastor is standing up in this magnificent meeting. Bill Gaither is there, and I'm there. Who else do you need? And we are at this meeting. <laughs> And the pa while the pastor is in the middle of speaking, 
this little boy comes up on stage and stands there and the pastor interrupts his message and he whispers something in the boy's ear then kisses him on the lips and without shame this kid who had to be 13 or 14 years old walked off the stage on the other side and out the other door. Now when the boy first walked up there my first thought was this kid's gonna get it. He's gonna get it good because he interrupted in the middle of a public meeting. When the pastor sat down, I said, what did you, what was that? What was that? Oh, he said, we do that all the time. He said, since the day that boy has been born, every night, I whisper in his ear that God loves him and that I love him. And then I pray that the angels of heaven will protect him. And I kissed him and sent him to bed. He says, there's been times when I've been speaking away from town, when I have excused myself, stepped into the hall, and made a phone call to say, son, I love you. And sitting in the front row, I began to weep, and I turned to him, and I said, would you be my dad? I was riding in an airplane at 30,000 feet. I had just received a national award. I was, I received it in front of a wonderful audience like this. They stood to their feet in loud applause. But I missed my dad. And so I took down a piece of paper and I wrote a letter to my father and I thanked him for telling me about Jesus. I missed my dad because my dad grew up in an era when men didn't say I love you. It's not considered cool even today. People might think you're weird. Give me a break. And I wrote this letter and at the end of the letter I wrote, I love you, Dad. Do you know I had never told my dad I loved him? Can't ever remember doing it. And I wasn't about to do it now. I kept the letter. What if he didn't respond? Finally, I found the courage to put it in an envelope and mail it. And then I sat by the phone waiting. I just wanted to hear him say, I got your letter. I love you too. One month, two months, three months went by. No answer. We went to visit my parents. As we drove in, my anger was intense. At least he could have called. A postcard, something. We walked in the house and my mother did that little thing that mothers do that tell you that something's up. <laughs> my dad went out into the garage and my mother said, come here. And she took me into the guest room and there on the wall, in a homemade frame, my dad had framed the letter. My mother, says, every, my mother said, every person who comes into this house, he drags into this room, makes, makes him stand here and read that letter. And suddenly I realized that this was my dad's way of shouting to me, I love you, son. I love you. I began to call my dad. We'd say we love each other all the time now. I send him pictures and news clippings and stuff I was afraid to before for fear he would think I was bragging. I send him everything I got. The other day, mom called me and said, stop sending stuff. He's building a shrine in that room. <laughs> At that Promise Keepers meeting, as those men began to proclaim their love for each other, I looked up and there was a man running down the aisle, an adult, a well-dressed adult. He stepped in front of the stage, 80,000 people. He said, I've lost my dad. My heart broke for him. I put the microphone behind me and I said, I'm so sorry. He said, no, I don't mean he's dead. I've lost him. <laughs> He said, we got separated, he's somewhere here, and I want to pray with him. I want to tell him I love him. I said, sir, you can tell your father later. Don't worry about it. And this man, this adult man, evidence of that wound in our hearts, bent like this into a fetal position. I need my father now. In front of 
all of those people I said, Mr. Joe Smith, whatever his name was, your son Jeffrey is down here and he needs you now. And the second I said that, and some of you may have been there, hundreds of men and boys began to scream from all over that place because they had been separated from their fathers, they had been separated from their sons, and they desperately needed to hear the words, I love you. I believe at the very bottom line of the human condition is men and women sitting in this room who need their father now. Not any father, their father. In a few years, you're going to look around and go, Holy mackerel. And you'd be looking at one of these. Beautiful young lady. In a few years, you're going to look at someone and say, Oh, I can't live without that person. And there will be a subtle idea planted in your brain, and this is the idea. If I could have that person, the wound would be healed. Do you know why so many of our marriages fail, I believe? Because we expect from each other what only God can supply. We expect from each other what we can't provide. I cannot heal the wound in my wife's heart. I can provide hope and I can give a glimpse of what God's love might be like. In fact, it is my responsibility, but I can't heal that wound that wound is only healed when we stand before God naked, when we stand before God with every blemish showing, with every sin right out in the open, and understand maybe for the first time that He loves us just the way we are. And the moment we understand that what Jesus did on the cross isn't just a religious thing, it's a personal thing. And that the message of this book from the beginning to the very end is this simple message. The creator of the universe saying to imperfect sinners, I love you! I love you! I love you! And the moment we embrace that, the wound is here. But you know what? It isn't healed like a neat little wound where they stitch it all up and you never see the scar. It's jammed full and it floods all over. It just bulges out everywhere so that you can love your mom and the man that's going to be your husband and your wife and the person who dissed you the other day. Right now, there are several thousand people going, did what to him? <laughs> Who put you down, your enemy? The mark of a Christian is not a list of things you don't do. I'm not endorsing even any of the lists that I gave you. According to Jesus, from the lips of Jesus himself, the mark of a Christian is someone who loves like he loved. When's the last time you said it to your wife? I love you. I wouldn't be here today. I would not be on this stage. I would be a headline. Except for the fact that in, I believe, a supernatural way, Jesus shouted to me, I love you, at the most critical moment in my life. Sheila's testimony this morning was all about beginning to understand it isn't being a success for God. It's just basking in His love and allowing Him to change you from the inside out. When's the last time you said it to your mom and dad? I challenge you, if they're not here, give them a call. Just call them, say I love you. Don't expect anything in return, you might not get it. I had one young lady call me and say, I called my mom and said I love you. She said, what do you want? 
But you know why she said that? She hadn't heard it. God doesn't say only love if you get love back. He says love like I love. And I'd like to make a list of ten ways you can love each other. But I'm just saying, why not just say it? Why not reconfirm what you said when you stood at that altar? Why not grab your son or daughter who may be sitting on this stage today and say, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am so concerned about your life and so concerned for your welfare that I just hover over you. I'm sorry. We're going to make a new start. But more than that, I love you. I love you. I love you. And when we know that we're loved, the wound is healed. And every once in a while, something comes along to tear it apart. But we go back to the truth. But God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. I'm done, but I close with this. I've used it a dozen times. I, I want especially to use it with you here. What is your name? Ben. Ben. Ben, let me tell you something. I've asked God to make me a courageous man. I've asked him to make, give me that kind of character. And tonight, if this building began to burn, Ben, I've asked God to give me the power and the strength to come there and risk my life to drag you out of here. And I think I'd do it. What's your name? Jason. Jason, and after I got Ben out, which would take me a while because he's a husky guy, I'd come back for you. And then I'd come back for you and you, and then I'd come back for you. Most nights. But not tonight. Do you know why? Somewhere sitting in this audience is my beautiful daughter, Taryn. And if this building starts to burn tonight, Jason, you better have the exits picked out on your own. <laughs> now, do you understand what I'm saying? As much as I would be willing to give my life for you personally, Jason, there is no way on the face of the earth that I could ever see my way to sacrifice my child for you. But God looked at you and me and that lady back there and the man sitting up there. And when we didn't deserve it, he said, I'll give my son. And then he says this, now, I want you to love each other. When you say I love you to your daddy, when you reach over in this moment and squeeze the wife, or the hand of your wife, <laughs> I almost said the wife of your friend. <laughs> <laughs> when you reach over and squeeze the hand of your wife, when people see you saying to each other, I love you, when they see you loving each other, the Bible says, then the world looks up and says, look at those people. Look at them. They must follow Jesus. My children, I can't be with you much longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, uh, you can't go where I'm going. So I tell you this. Love each other. Like I loved you. And if you love each other like I love you, then all men will know that you follow me. Father in heaven. Give us the courage to take those steps. If there is a man or a woman here who does not know you, oh dear Lord, I pray that they might open their arms to receive the forgiveness that you made available at the cross. And that in doing so, they might physically feel that wound being healed. And I pray that there will be husbands and wives who whisper the words as this meeting closes. Kids who say it to mom. Dads who say it to their children. 
so that the world will say, whatever those people got, they must have gotten it from God. And I want some. In Jesus' name.